All right, it looks like things are leveling out in the attendees. Looks like people are getting settled in. Um, so yeah, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I am Cam Cooper. I'm a national outreach organizer with Represent Us. Uh, and I'm so glad you could join us. We have so many familiar faces. It's so nice. Well, not faces, but familiar names. And it's nice to see everyone. Um, in just a few minutes, we're going to bring on Ed Helms to talk about um, our new short film, Unbreaking America, Drowning in Student Debt. And then we'll dig into a deeper conversation about the For the People Act with Represent Us research analyst Anlin Carney. Um, but before we get started, we just have a few um, logistical items or housekeeping items to share with folks, specifically in the Zoom chat um, and or the Zoom call, um, mostly being the chat. We encourage everyone to use the chat box um, to communicate with us and with each other. It looks like everybody's into that, so that's working out great. Um, we'll also be doing a Q&A at the end of the call, um, and so to share your questions with us, you can add them to the Q&A box rather than the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll get to as many of those as we can by the end of the call. Um, and we are also recording this call tonight, um, and we will share this video with all of you afterwards. Um, it's also being live streamed to a few social media sites. So um, yeah, uh, with that, uh, how many folks have seen the new Unbreaking America short film with Ed Helms? So many me's in the chat, yes. So many folks have seen it. That's so great. Um, well, we I'll post the video link in the chat for anyone who hasn't seen it um, so that you can check it out after this call. Um, and now I'm gonna pass the mic over to our host, Anlin Kearney, uh, to discuss anti-corruption with our special guest star, Ed Helms. Hi, thank you so much, Cam. Ed, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I wanna start by just recognizing what an incredible supporter, there he is, hi. Hey. Um, you've just been such an incredible supporter of Represent Us. You aren't just the star of our latest Unbreaking America short film, but you hosted our Unrig Summit. You were part of an event we hosted pre-election that brought together thousands of people and raised over $2 million that went directly towards saving the election. Uh, you are also on the Represent Us board, so that means you're technically my boss. Uh, so, boss, uh, why anti-corruption and why represent us? First of all, you're doing a fantastic job, um, but I'm not going to give you that raise you asked for. No, I, I'm not. Uh, um, sorry, what was the question again? I was busy telling a dumb joke. No, uh, so why do you care about anti-corruption and what drew you to work with Represent Us? Oh, um, I don't know. I, uh, so... Anti-corruption to me is just one of the most basic fundamental things uh, that we can all agree on, uh, or at least anyone who's intellectually honest and has decent intentions can agree that corruption is bad. And, uh, and not only is corruption bad, it is ubiquitous and it is so prevalent and it is completely legal. Uh, there are so many ways that our system is just built to um, built to foster corruption and reward corruption, and so um, I, I, I'm I'm not a terribly smart guy. I just that, and so something like that is such it's like low hanging fruit. I'm going for that. That's something I want to fix. Uh, I don't know. It's that simple. Wow. Yeah, that I, I totally hear you on that. And I bet a lot of our audience really agrees. Um, you know, speaking of our uh, last Unbreaking America Drowning in Student Debt video, uh, why are you passionate about student loan debt specifically? Well, um, I, I'm just a big uh, kind of education nerd in general. I, I care a lot about um, education, access to education. And of course, uh, people being able to enjoy the fruits of education. And um, if you're drowning in debt, that's really hard. And it's also uh, a, a, really, a really good prism through which to view corruption because uh, the student debt crisis is the result of corruption, right? It's, uh, you know, the big lending institutions, banks, um, financial institutions, uh, they give a lot of money to people in Congress and those people write policy that is very friendly to them. And in fact, when it comes to student loans in particular, the policy is just 
abhorrent and it is completely stacked against uh, people taking out loans. I, I, I hear a lot of people, there's a, the, you know, I think the, there's a common refrain among opponents to this stuff, which is like, well, you take out a loan, you just pay it. What's the big deal? Why is, you know, a personal responsibility, you take out a loan, you pay it back. Why is that? Well, it, that would be a, a, a sound argument if student loans were fair and were, and were handled in the same way that mortgages or car loans were handled. They're not. They're, they're much more, uh, they're, they're much more complex and they're much, they're built in a way uh, that allows banking institutions to exploit the borrower. So um, it's a perfect feedback loop and a very obvious, um, a very obvious example of, of that feedback loop of corruption. And so I think it's a very helpful uh, issue to focus on in addition to the, the humanity of it, which is just people suffering from debt and really having trouble getting their lives started. Wow. Yeah. I think that that's definitely why your video resonated so much with so many people and especially those who have joined us today. So, you know, just with the prevalence of student loan debt, it really, what you said, it really does illustrate the issue of corruption. Um, so what's so important about this moment specifically for the anti-corruption movement? This is an incredible moment. Uh, there is a bill, um, the For the People Act, that is going to be before Congress very soon. It is, uh, it's, it's kind of revolutionary. It, it's, the, it's the most strident anti-corruption policy uh, to, to be seriously considered since Watergate. And, um, and it's, I, I think we're, I think the moment, this moment is so critical because we've just seen, we've just been through this, uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter what side, you know, what, what side of the political spectrum you're on. If you're, you know, even if you're a, a Trump supporter or whatever, uh, or a, a progressive person, you've, chances are you have either felt a lot of um, pain in the last few years or observed people close to you uh, in pain. And that could be financial pain. It could be uh, medical pain. It could be, um, you know, mental health issues. It, there's so many ways that people are suffering right now. And that is awful, <laughs> obviously. It's also fuel for change. It's also an opportunity. Uh, and it's also something that um, that opens uh, the possibility of, of real change, because I think there's a lot of anger that goes along with that. And anger can be a very healthy emotion if it's, uh, if it's channeled correctly. It should be channeled into getting the For the People Act passed, because uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a bill that, that basically forces Congress to be more responsible to their constituents and to be more transparent. Uh, it addresses gerrymandering. It addresses, uh, you know, uh, presidential powers, uh, voter access, uh, so many things. And whatever issue you care most about, uh, you know, for me, student debt's a big one. I have a lot of issues I care a lot about. Um, chances are that issue you care a lot about is just hung up in Congress right now and not getting moving forward. Healthcare, uh, incarceration, all kinds of stuff. There's not a lot of movement happening on these things and it's because of the cycle of corruption. The For the People Act gets a lot, it gets things a lot better. It fixes a lot. And uh, it's the, it's, so that's all to just say, this is a, a, a very, very critical moment for anyone who cares about corruption. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for that, man. I wish people who said that Hollywood celebrities are disconnected could have heard that because it sounds like you really know exactly what's going on. And yeah, at this moment, what's happening right now and what people care about. Um, one last question for you. Uh, what's one thing you would ask people to do in this moment to help? There, there are two things. Um, well, three things. Number one, just bug the shit out of your representatives calls, emails, you know, tweet at them, whatever you can do. Number two, spread the word. Let your friends, your family, your Facebook 
community, anyone, anyone within shouting distance, uh, let them know about HR1, the For the People Act, and how important it is uh, and how critical it is. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, and you're already doing it, jump on board with Represent Us and, uh, and let Represent Us help, help you understand these things better and give you opportunities to help. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. That was so informative. Ed, thank you so much. I really can't appreciate, can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here. Um, you're welcome to stick around and watch the presentation, but uh, everyone else, Ed has to go. Um, uh, so if you're ready to take action in support of the act, you can go to represent.us forward slash call dash Congress to call your representative after this call. Ed, again, thank you so, so much. Uh, Thanks so much. And I just want to say to everyone on this call there, I see there's, there are a lot of people on board. Thanks for being here. Thanks for caring. Thanks for getting involved and uh, keep, keep up the good fight. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Ed. We will. All right, you guys, that was, that was awesome. That was so informative. I feel like Ed covered so many of the topics, uh, but I, I, I also created a presentation for you. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about um, what Ed's talking about before the People Act, okay? Um, so here we go. Uh, let's talk about what's in the bill. So we're gonna talk about the For the People Act in the context of something you may know about if you've been with Represent Us for very long. It's called the American Anti-Corruption Act. It's also known as the AACA. Uh, this is the legislation we've been advancing at Represent Us since our founding, and we've passed this in various forms in cities and states around the country with bipartisan support. Nearly all of the, these reforms are somehow embodied in the For the People Act, which is also known as the FTPA. It's unbelievably exciting that we now have the opportunity to uh, pass these reforms at the federal level. So let me show you a little bit more about what this act looks like. These are, this is a side-by-side. -side. This shows you what the AACA does versus what the FTPA does. And you see what's missing. You see where more work is needed, perhaps through future legislation, but you can also tell what a huge step forward this is, right? This is a map of where the uh, American Anti-Corruption Act has been implemented. And this is what it would look like if the For the People Act was implemented. And that is just, so exciting, all right? So you might say, yeah, on Lynn, this sounds great, but I don't know anything about this policy. How does it actually do all those things? And, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you, uh, let's go piece by piece. Remember this legislation is over 700 pages long, so there's no way we'll cover everything, but I want you to know some of the main ways these reforms accomplish this mission that you all care about, okay? Um, bear with me, lots of details. You came here for a policy talk, so here we go. Uh, the first part, uh, the For the People Act increases election security and voter participation, right? How does it do that? Um, it ensures access to early voting and voting by mail. It provides automatic voter registration, online and same day voter registration. Future voters age 16 and up can pre-register to vote. It helps uh, uh, states coordinate checking their voter rolls and it restores voting rights in federal elections to the formerly incarcerated, okay? The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated just how critical access to early voting and voting by mail really is. We saw a patchwork of emergency orders all over the country dealing with the pandemic election, dealing with uh, voting in different ways and it caused confusion, long lines, it put voters at risk, right? Uh, I know that, you know, uh, here in Texas, where I'm based, we experienced that, you know, uh, voting by mail was used in 29 states, uh, five states, including my home state required an excuse and uh, eight states required a witness if you wanted to vote by mail. Okay. Um, now this act ensures that everyone can safely access their ballot, even in a pandemic with uh, 14 days of early voting, secure paper ballots and the option to vote from home. This mail option has the added security of allowing voters to track their mail ballot and confirm its receipt, okay? Um, now, I wanna talk a little bit more about the voter registration stuff. So we're gonna go back to our slide, okay? Um, the voter registration piece is huge because it removes so many barriers to access. 40 states already use online voter registration. 21 states and DC use same day voter registration. 
automatic voter registration is already used in 16 states. We have this in my state and it's something I'm really excited about. When you go to the government office, such as a DMV, you're automatically added to your state's voter rolls, uh, but the state forms still provide you an option to opt out, right? And when you're at one of these places, there's an added level of security here that people don't talk about because valid state issued ID is always required. This is often the place you go to even obtain that idea, uh, ID. Um, additionally, the For the People Act would ensure that those 16 year olds who are walking in for their driver's license get to pre-register to vote in case they don't show up again when they're 18. So this is a really, really exciting reform. Um, another important provision here is the voter roll verification. This isn't a really well understood concept and honestly you could have a totally different call on the issues of voter rolls, voter roll purging, discriminatory, discriminatory tactics used by states to kick voters off of voter rolls. Um, so using a interstate registration center to cross check voter rolls increases election security and prevents voters from bouncing between rolls and slipping through the cracks if they were to move states. Now, this last piece I'm really excited about, this is the voting rights restoration. This is a huge step forward, but keep in mind it only applies to federal cases, okay? Five states on their own have enacted uh, their own voting rights restoration laws, and there's an ever-increasing bipartisan consensus that sees this as the right thing to do. Um, the map you're seeing right now shows us uh, the status of voting rights restoration laws across the 50 states for the formerly incarcerated. You can see that each state gets to decide this for themselves. Um, and when that happens, voters in places like Florida are uh, put in a position where they have to use the ballot initiative process to pass these reforms themselves. Um, in Florida in 2018, we saw Amendment 4 to restore voting rights for the formerly incarcerated. It passed with bipartisan support by a whopping 65%. Uh, and this is our other board member, Desmond Mead, that uh, I'm so honored to work for. Um, he championed this and it passed uh, in a traditionally red state. This was an incredible win. And it would bring this kind of win, this kind of reform nationwide. So that's why we're so excited about it. Voting rights activists view felony disenfranchisement as one of the last frontiers of the civil rights and voting rights movement. Black and brown people are disproportionately affected by felony disenfranchisement. And the For the People Act makes leaps and bounds of progress uh, by giving a political voice back to those who have paid their debt to society. Uh, this is a truly nonpartisan issue, right? It's even overwhelmingly supported in traditionally red states like Florida, okay? Uh, speaking of traditionally red states, let's talk about gerrymandering. Um, if you've been a supporter of Rep. us for long, you know how huge this issue is to us. Voters should pick their candidates, not the other way around. Uh, the For the People Act takes a huge step forward on this. It takes the redistricting power for congressional elections out of the hands of politicians, and it puts it in the hands of an independent redistricting commission. Doesn't stop there. It lays out specific rules governing, you know, who can be a commissioner, how commission actions take place, what kind of criteria new maps need to be drawn by, that's huge. And the most exciting part maybe is that it makes sure that citizens get input. Uh, now we've just finished another census, redistricting is happening right now. Uh, state legislators get to determine the maps right now and they're already rigging the hand for themselves with very few guardrails that have been set in place by the Voting Rights Act, the US Constitution and other Supreme Court precedent. But we know it's not enough because in 2018, the Supreme Court actually decided that the question of partisan gerrymandering was, or whether it's unconstitutional, that it's beyond their reach. So um, this bill, I see it, it really cuts through the jurisprudence and it makes the law absolutely clear as day, it says here on out, partisan gerrymandering is illegal at the federal level. And for me to even be telling you that, that that's an option right now is so, so exciting. Uh, now we can look to my home state of Texas as an example. Uh, why have maps like this with districts shaped like 33 in Dallas here on my right and 35 where I live in Austin? It's shaped like a, yeah, it goes from Austin to San Antonio. That's crazy. Um, now these maps could, you know, look like this. Look at those compact districts. These lines make more sense and the people who live here will tell you they make more sense given the political realities. Okay. So, you know, I don't like to ever call out my own state, but it's so needed because places like Texas, they won't do this for themselves, all right? So this bill at least changes it at the federal level, at least changes it for uh, federal congressional elections. So it's just one of another million reasons why I'm so, so excited to be talking to you about this bill. Now, another reason is the way this bill will strengthen ethics and financial conflict of interest laws for the president. 
Congress and the Supreme Court, okay? Right now, the last few years have seen tests like this, to never, like never before seen tests to the existing gaps in presidential disclosure requirements and conflict of interest issues. The president's uh, appointees are also currently subject to a more strict set of ethics rules than the president themselves. Now, the For the People Act would fix that by including raising those disclosure requirements, applying them to the president, and so, or the president, which means that they would have to disclose financial entanglements and they'd be required to divest from potential conflicts of interest. Um, uh, one of the other uh, provisions in this section is about having political appointees of the president recuse themselves on issues related to the president's financial interests. Um, now, this removes the appearance of impropriety because the same way we can't trust lawmakers to honestly regulate themselves, we shouldn't trust those appointed to power uh, to regulate those who can remove them. And, uh, you know, the past couple of years, President Trump's continued ownership and control of businesses that have contracts with the government and the White House, it's their, the White House's interference in the Mueller investigation, these are just recent examples that raise the sort of prospect, the awareness, right, of presidents using their authority to exert pressure on their political appointees for personal gain. So if those political appointees are required to recuse themselves, um, then that takes an incentive away that shouldn't really be there in the first place. Uh, lastly, the taxes. The taxes. We should not rely on public pressure and goodwill for this. Uh, we shouldn't rely on the New York Times to leak this. Uh, it needs to be required from here on out. We need to avoid some of the problems that we've seen in the past. Oh, I don't know how that got in there. Maybe I do. Okay, so uh, one of the other provisions I'm really excited about. This bill shines a light on dark money, it rains in super PACs, and it closes the lobbyist loophole because since Citizens United, dark money has been allowed to pervade at the federal level because many groups aren't required to reveal the true source of their contributions. So the big advancement here is forcing dark money groups to open their books and give us a better view of what super PACs are up to. Additionally, by expanding the list of activities that deem a super PAC coordinated with the campaign, you bring more of these groups and their activities out of secret. And instead of them getting to be this secret big money arm of a political campaign, they have to disclose things like this. Okay, so this is really exciting. A lot of things get lost in this, um, in this gap. So this really, this is a really, really needed reform that I'm excited about. Uh, now, one of the other things this will do is will dramatically decrease politicians' dependence on special interests and lobbyist money. This is huge. And the For the People Act accomplished this in two different ways. So again, these aren't, uh, the first is this uh, small dollar donation matching program. And the second is a pilot program for democracy vouchers. I totally understand if those words don't mean a lot to you right now. So bear with me, they aren't widely understood. And there's, I've got some good details here for you if you care about it, okay? So for the first, the small dollar donation matching program, candidates would be required, candidates for Congress and uh, federal Congress, they'd be required to raise $50,000 from individuals to demonstrate their viability. And then the candidate could be eligible to have um, donations under $200 matched six to one by public funds. And this is paid for not out of citizen tax revenue, but by a 2.75% surcharge on certain criminal fines from corporate defendants and their executive officers, okay? Uh, this creates more responsive policymaking and it frees up time for politicians from fundraising and they are sure, um, you know, they, they pay, they're paid by the work, by their voters, not um, through, uh, a uh, special interest. Now the voucher program, this is real public campaign financing. That is so exciting. This is something Seattle has implemented in city elections since 2017. The For the People Act would establish a voucher pilot program. So three states would get to have this program where eligible voting age citizens could request vouchers worth $25, donate them to congressional candidates of their choice. By broadening the donor base, your politician is no longer accountable to secret interests. They're accountable to voters like you and me, okay? So this is, I mean, just so, so, so inspiring, so exciting. Um, it's been happening. Uh, public campaign financing has been discussed in uh, red and blue states, cities all over the country. And if you're in Austin like me, it's gonna be on your ballot in May. So make sure to look out for that. 
So let's sum it up, right? I know that was a lot. I threw tons of information at you at once, but what I really want you to leave knowing is that this is the opportunity of a lifetime of a generation. It's the product of decades and decades of advocacy, so many wins and losses at the local and state level, people organizing in communities just like yours to demand these changes at the local level. And we've seen voters demand these different reforms. We've watched them take hold in places all over the country. You saw the map, you've seen the way it's bubbling up from all over the place. And now it's becoming common sense changes being proposed at the federal level. Okay, so I know that all sounds pretty great, right? What's going on with it? What? Why can't they just pass it already, okay? Um, last thing I want you to know is that this has broad, overwhelming public support. This, this uh, poll right in front of you, it shows you that there is a majority that has supported HR1. So, you know, that's just all the more exciting, okay? So what's going on with this bill? This bill was introduced actually last year. It actually even passed in the House, uh, but it died in the Senate. And so right now it's receiving all of this new attention and consideration, not only because of all the things we've talked about and just the way that last year had demonstrated the need for this like never before, but we also have a new administration, a new Congress, a new Senate majority leader who is promising a Senate vote on this bill. So, ah, it's so exciting. Um, now there's a couple of other once in a generation issues demanding Congress's attention right now. I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's another second impeachment going on that's never happened before um there's also COVID 19 relief these things are so important but we can't turn down the heat in the meantime where uh, we can't let them think that we uh, we've forgotten we need to them to know this is this has to be your next priority okay and so we're expecting this to potentially be be the next bill they consider uh we're expecting a hearing in the house first maybe early march and we ex we, we hope it'll pass there again right but we know that representatives who voted in favor of this last year, they could be reconsidering given a really competitive election cycle since then. So remember that nothing is a given. However, we still think the Senate will be the main battleground. We've got historically close margins in there. So that's why it's all the more important that your representatives know how much you care about this. Um, and like anything that would dramatically change the system and take power back from politicians, this bill has already become the target of misleading partisan rhetoric and misinformation. This isn't a conspiracy to federalize all elections. States will continue to run state elections for state seats. This isn't a partisan ploy to steal elections. These reforms really benefit everyone across the political spectrum and they have enjoyed support from everyone across the political spectrum, just like they did when they were piloted at the state and local level. But we know how tough the grip of partisanship and misinformation is. So this is where you can help. I know Ed already talked to you about what he wants you to do, right? So we're just gonna let you know, we've got extra resources for you. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do right now. First of all, this is the link to uh, uh, your representatives. You can also tell your friends about it. We've got a great uh, social media toolkit linked here so that you can spread the word online. And if you're really fired up about this, we would love for you to join us and uh, come volunteer with us, okay? Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for letting me talk to you about a uh, reform that I'm really excited and honored to work on, really excited to um, see it be proposed, be considered. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I've got um, a few minutes left here for some questions and answers. So anything you wanna drop into that Q&A box, I'll go ahead and look over those and pull out a couple that I can help with. Let me give you guys a little, a few moments to get all those in there and I will um, take a peek, let's see. Thank you so much, Amlin, for sharing all that. Um, yeah, as Amlin said, we're gonna be getting into the QA portion now. Um, so for folks in the Zoom, uh, that will be located at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over the bottom, you'll see the QA button so you can submit a question there. Um, and I also saw a lot of questions during the presentation about if the presentation will be shared out. This call is actually being recorded right now. Um, and we'll send out an email to everybody who RSVP'd to the event um, on our website so that they'll get, a, you all get a recording of it that has those slides in it. Um, and we can include all of the links as well um, so that everybody has those. And I know a lot of things are moving fast and that was a really informative presentation. So uh, we're all taking it in, uh, but yes. So that will be shared in an email, most likely going out uh, tomorrow morning. So just wanted to say that. Thanks, Cam. Hey, Cam, I'm having a hard time pulling up the Q&A. Will you be able to look in there and, and uh, help me field or 
pass along some questions. It's not pulling up for me, but I think maybe you might be the person who can look at that. I sure can, yeah, I have it pulled up. Uh, we have quite a few. Uh, let me have a look through and see, let's pull out some fun ones. Um, so Joyce, uh, and also voice, voice this in the chat, uh, Joyce asks, uh, what can we do to reach more conservative audiences and get their support um, of the FTPA? Oh gosh, okay, well, I love this question because this identifies something that we're seeing happening right now. There's a lot of misinformation going on and it's become a really big partisan issue when it's really, I mean, as we've gone through a really bipartisan bill. So, you know, like Ed said, one of the main things you can do is just talk to people you know, talk to people you know about, uh, you know, what this bill is, your conservative friends, and we can be the people who are dispelling this mis misinformation, right? Um, yeah, really just spreading the word and encouraging your representatives wherever you are to um, to support this. What else, Cam? Awesome. Uh, some folks are also asking um, if we can uh, have an impact on the 2021 uh, gerrymandering and the census and all that, um, if we pass this soon and kind of what the, the deadline, I guess, would be for that. Gosh, okay, wow, yeah. You guys are thinking so, so into the details and I love that. Um, yes. Yeah, so if, you know, it's all, it's all so up in the air, right? It's Congress, you know, we don't know what they're gonna do, but um, we're hoping that they will make some amendments once this bill gets onto the floor that ensures that that ban on partisan gerrymandering is implemented as soon as possible. So um, that's something we're really hoping to see. And, you know, honestly, I think that the fact that this is a huge issue, the fact that everybody is getting fired up about gerrymandering means that, you know, your state representatives know. And uh, you can also get involved in your own state's redistricting process, you know? So even, you know, we're, we're really hoping this bill passes and, you know, regardless of whether it does, you're still gonna be able to get involved at the local level and um, try to affect that uh, uh, redistricting process there. Um, keep in mind, the census is actually delayed right now. So it, it makes a lot of things harder, but it pushes the timeline on redistricting back a lot more. So basically what that means is that we have more time to pass this bill so that hopefully these these reforms can be implemented before the redistricting process begins. Um, thank you so much for that question. Cam, what else? Yeah, love that. Um, we, we also had someone ask uh, if they, they don't have time to volunteer and so they'd like to know if they can donate. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw the donate link in the chat right now for Zoom. Uh, if anyone cares to donate for it to us. It's just represent.us slash donate. And I'm going to share that, uh, share that now in the chat. Um, uh, a lot of people are also asking um, what, since this is such a complex and nuanced kind of bill, um, what, uh, what ties would it have to student loans more specifically and how would it really impact yeah, yeah. So like Ed had kind of said at the top, a lot of the reason that we can't pass student loan debt reform is because Congress is gridlocked around this issue and because they aren't really incentivized to, to work on this issue, right? They're busy calling fundraisers, calling donors, and they, you know, we all, so many people, normal people care about student loan debt, but the people who are bankrolling politicians' campaigns right now, they, they don't. So by implementing public financing, by giving voters a bigger voice when it comes to donations, um, those are going to move not only student loan debt forward, but a lot of the other issues that you and I care about forward um, and really interrupt that partisan gridlock. That is a lot of the reason that student loan debt and other issues have been stalled uh, at, at Congress. Uh, uh, what else? Let's do, let's do a couple more. I've got maybe like five more minutes. Yeah, great. Um, some folks are asking uh, just how they can have an impact if they know for sure that their legislators are against the bill. Um, mm. And my first thought, obviously, is to, you know, to just volunteer. And so I'll share the volunteer link in the chat. Um, but if you want to talk a little bit about the impact of that um, on on voters or on representatives who are already decided. Yeah. Gosh, right. Well, don't you hate when they decide after, you know, hearing from without hearing from the voters first? Um, gosh, yeah, the problem within a problem. But thank you, Cam. Yeah, you're so right. You know, volunteering, getting involved, plugging in to our outreach efforts, um, that those are all ways you can get involved. I think that, you know, when legislators say that they don't support something, they that's not permanent, right? There's no vote that's happened right now. Just because they're against it right now doesn't mean you guys can't change their minds doesn't mean that public pressure isn't going to work. 
So that's really one of the main things that we can do right now. Um, and, you know, once once this does pass, you know, hopefully there's going to be a day whenever um, those politicians are going to be more responsive to us because now post for the People Act, we've got more power. What else? Love that. Um, yeah, folks are asking um, about the sponsorship of the bill. So I know this has been kind of a fun thing we've talked about um, is who all sponsored it and what kind of support did it have originally? It's been around for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. Representative Sarbanes is the main sponsor on it in the House. And I, I don't have the other guy off the top of my head, uh, right? But, um, you know, it does have bipartisan support. Uh, and, you know, that the sponsor is right. That's who introduced it. Um, so Representative Sarbanes uh, is the one who introduced that. What other questions about about sort of sponsorship or, or whatever? Jeff Merkley in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Becky and Jen. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, what, what other questions about around sponsorship, right? Or is there other questions? Uh, it seemed like folks were most just curious if it had bipartisan support um, from what I'm seeing in the chat. Um, and folks are also kind of concerned that it'll get significantly watered down um, before it actually gets passed. I know this is something that's already come up a couple of times rather interestingly. So what are the concerns around uh, that actually passing but it not having the same weight that it could have? Yeah, oh my gosh. I mean, that's that's such a good thing to be looking out for right now. That is exactly how involved uh, voters, involved citizens should be thinking about these reforms right, right now. Um, we're going to be closely monitoring this at Represent Us. By following us, you're gonna be able to get all the latest updates on what happens to this bill, what kinds of amendments are getting introduced, what kinds of amendments are being proposed to chip away at some of these reforms. And honestly, because there's such a tight margin in both houses right now, it you know we expect to see a lot of that. And it, just like any huge big reform bill, they're gonna pack it, pack it with pork, like they say. Um, so this is something that we're just going to be really keeping an eye on here at Represent Us. We're going to be telling you guys everything we know, making sure that you guys know what's going on and that if it is watered down, if it is, um, you know, taken, uh, taken down a notch that you guys will be able to respond, let your legislators know that that's not acceptable. We need all of these reforms. We need all these reforms and more, but this is the place we have to start. Awesome. Love that. Um, in that same vein, um, a couple of people have pointed out that uh, separating out the campaign finance reform from voting rights is something that a lot of folks are supportive of, um, more conservative folks. Have you heard anything about that or do you have anything to, to add to that? No, that's a really, really interesting sort of proposal. Uh, I think that question sort of assumes that maybe people wouldn't be as supportive of public financing public campaign financing, right, as they would be a voting rights restoration. They, people want these to be separate bills so that they could all pass at different times. The way I see it, you know, all of these reforms work together to help each other. And so it makes a lot of intuitive sense that when you're writing a bill that's about voter empowerment, that you include voting rights restoration and you also include public campaign financing because they both work to that end. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why I think that or that I'm I'm glad that they're talked about together right now, um, and so that's you know I hope that it doesn't get separated out like that. You know we it, it remains to be seen. These are all up in the air. These are totally the right things to be asking about because you guys seem to know your legislators really well. You seem to know your politics really well, and you know how they how they like to do this and take away those uh, reforms that we're asking for. So we're going to keep you informed of this. Um, and uh, we're going to be advocating against watering this bill down at, at all. Love that. Great. Um, well, I know we're getting into the last few minutes here. Um, a lot of folks are asking, uh, like, what folks do to volunteer, what kind of volunteer opportunities we offer. And so I just want to real quick kind of list off. Uh, I'll, I'll put my video back up. Hello. Um, I list off some of the opportunities. Every uh, Thursday, we host a big event, either phone banking or text banking, where you'll be calling folks or texting folks. Uh, in support of this bill. Um, we also hold events uh, with our meme team crew, which is folks to our social media team who create content to share and educate folks on social media. Um, and you can sign up for any of those at represent.us slash events for our events calendar, um, or you can go to represent.us slash volunteer. Um, yeah, so that, I think that about wraps us up. Is there any parting words you'd like to share online? 
No, just thank thank you guys again. And you know, if Ed's still around, Ed Helms, thank you so much for joining us and informing us on this issue. I'm so, so uh, honored that you joined us. I'm so honored that all of our uh, attendees are here. Thank you so much for your time, for volunteering to sit on a Zoom call and listen to someone lecture you about a bill. Seriously, I'm, I'm so inspired by our volunteer base. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate being here. Thank you guys for um, chatting with us. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining. These issues of corruption and abuse of power impact all of us um, as we've talked about a lot tonight. So regardless of where you come from or who you are, you've probably experienced or seen someone suffer because of corruption and it's gonna take all of us to fix it since it impacts all of us. Um, so if you've already called your representative, that's great. If you plan to, that's great. Um, also, if you plan to volunteer, we just appreciate having you in our tent and everyone is welcome. Um, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Awesome. Thank you guys.